I'm sorry I look a bit dishevelled. Um, in fact, I'm very Parisian today. <laughs> life. But it's a good place to be dishevelled, actually, and the floor below is generally even more dishevelled than I am, and I'm sorry to be half asleep because it's been uh, quite an interesting day for me. Um, but I'm not going to talk about uh, whatever the future might be. At least for me, I'm going to talk about my, my, my present job because it seems to me um, a, a, actually that I've neither, I've neither got the uh, means nor the desire to challenge uh, David's view and the views that we have been heard about um, transport between cities. Um, but we can certainly reflect on what's happened in this city um, and of course, this is the most extraordinary transformation, both of the place and its transport network. I joined London Transport nearly 40 years ago when the city was in decline and so was its transport system. Uh, and one of the reasons I don't get asked to do retirement dues of people my age very often is that I'm not prepared to subscribe to the idea that it was always better in the old days, because it wasn't. It was awful. We ran a really bad service and we contributed ourselves to the decline in the city by, in, uh, by not enabling people to move around it uh, either regularly or, or in comfort or in some cases at all. Now, now of course it's very different and the success of this place is, is, is testament to the adage that success builds on success. So the population growth rate is faster than it's ever been, uh, 70 or 80,000 people a year. It's bigger than it's ever been, 8.6 million. Boris was uh, see, see, seeking rather um, hopelessly to find the person who was born who was going to tip it over the edge uh, and wrote a whole brilliant speech about what that person will think about in 30 years. Um, but uh, but it will be 9 million by 20, 2018 and it certainly it looks, shows every likelihood of being 10 million by, by, by 2030. And, and how have we got there? Well, actually we've got there by a very un-British scheme of uh, governance, which is um, a strategic political leader um, with a strategic responsibility um, and some operational responsibilities that mirror the strategic responsibility of an overall plan for London uh, and a transport strategy that sits underneath it. How, how, how we got there is really quite interesting because um, it's, it's well, well known, I think, that, that, that uh, Mrs Thatcher didn't much like Ken Livingstone nor, nor his version of the GLC, but, and, and it wasn't that w that was recreated. But it, it was really business, I would, I would contend, who, who argued all the way through the 90s that the place was struggling through lack of a strategic focus in order to develop its own economy and the economy of the country. And it was business in the end that persuaded Tony Blair to establish the mayoralty. It's still a mystery to me how anybody managed to establish the post without working out who should fill it. Uh, and then along came Ken and said, I've done this before. Um, actually, um, I'm not suitable to be a member of a political party, but I'll get elected anyway. Um, and uh, then he showed you what you could do if you actually embraced at least business principles, if not the politics of business, uh, and, and actually got the place going. And I, and I, think, that, I, I think that what we've been able to demonstrate in terms of de delivery is testament to a system which has somebody who is obliged to look at the 20 or 30 year future of the uh, London economy on of the, and, and thus of the spatial planning that's needed in the transport system. Um, uh, he, he was blessed, I hope, with some people who knew what they could do and were prepared to push the boundaries out in terms of things like congestion charging. And then the other really important thing, which has eluded uh, people in my position literally for generations, was the, uh, was the ability to harness the nonsense of the PPP with the underlying proposition, which was entirely correct, that you need a long-term investment plan to successfully deliver investment. And, and, and actually out of the wreckage of the PPP, we, we use the acknowledgement that you might be able to go, get good value if at the end of every year you could roll the money over and develop some longer schemes. I was a victim, as some other people will probably remember in similar organisations, of an organisation that used to buy office furniture in vast quantities in March because you couldn't roll the money over and you wouldn't get any more unless you spent it. Um, and now we've proved that actually you can it, you can install uh, railway signalling systems, uh, but not, notwithstanding the fact many of them are sold by snake oil salesmen, but you can, you can install them much more effectively if the people who knew how to do one job have moved on to the next one sit, sit, sit seamlessly. Um, so we, we, we've done 
pretty well for ourselves, I think, and I, I'm not taking credit myself, I'm just a facilitator for getting, getting all this done. Um, we haven't quite got total devolution because there are parts of the railway network in London that sadly are not, not, not as good as our own system can deliver, and indeed it's, it's actually the National Railway Network in London which is going to keep the city going uh, with transport growth and, uh, uh, resulting from population growth in the next 10 years, which is why devolution and the um, turning London orange, or whichever phrase Andrew cares to use, is going to have to be the answer because it will be the only way that we'll get population into the places where you can put it uh, and get them, get them to work. So that's a bit of unfinished business with devolution, though I think we'll, we'll win that. But the thing that's really missing out of this is, 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 is the fiscal responsibility and the fiscal devolution. And there are two aspects to that, actually. One, one is that, as you can see currently with what you read in the, sta in, in the standard uh, daily from candidates who might be more or less responsible, that actually everybody is doing a, a, a downward bidding in the fares war because none of them feel the necessity of balancing the fares that they feel like charging with the investment that's, uh, that's created as a result. Ken once said to me that he thought that I was totally in favour always of putting the fares up, and so I am, because I want the money. I think there's another responsibility, which is to Alex's question about, about the political sensibilities of that. And there may yet be another question to be asked about this, which is not whether fares should be cheaper because poor people have now got to live in Tolworth or Enfield, because that's where they have to live because people like my son are living in Allgate and flats worth half a million quid a year, but actually whether there should be some other mechanism which protects the transport operator's income and hence its expenditure and actually looks at the income of poor people and supplements the income to avoid season ticket holders from Hayward, Heath and Brighton benefiting from cheap fares that you put in to, to enable poor people in Tolworth to access office cleaning jobs in... in, in uh, uh, in, in central London and those jobs are needed to be done and they're not ever going to pay much so we might actually have to find a way of doing that which is about their income and not about my fares income. But wider than that of course is this general issue about fiscal devolution which is most marked when you come to argue for big projects and, and Steve Allen who's my fabulous finance director who's sitting in the audience and others here were instrumental in the wider economic appraisal of of Crossrail, which produced a scheme that, that looked as if it could be done. There isn't any question, even halfway through it, that it's worth doing, is there? Does anybody in the audience think we shouldn't have done Crossrail, bearing in mind the scale of the development you can see in the West End and the city and Canary Wharf and in other places in Western East London? No, there isn't. Of course there isn't. It's an absolutely obvious thing to do. But the, but the, but the, the fraught nature of that argument is actually all about both, the, both how wide the economic appraisal is and particularly where the money comes from. And I, and I think that, 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 that we are seeking to address the future issue about fiscal devolution in London, um, primarily through the means of Crossrail 2. One of the things about Crossrail 2 is Boris wants us to carry on boring with the machines. You can hear him saying it, can't you? Sadly, they're, sadly, they're mostly in the wrong place and they're not going to bore anymore because they finished boring what they were supposed to bore. But his, his philosophy is right, of course, and actually one of the things that I can foresee, I won't be here now, I'll be somewhere else watching it, uh, not very far away, I don't suppose, but um, actually when Crossrail fully opens through central London, that evening's evening standard will say how stupid we all were that Crossrail 2 isn't further ahead. It will become self-evident the day it opens that it will actually be fuller than anybody supposed and that the development which, 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 which it spurned already will be producing numbers of people that only it will be able to cope with. So then you look at Crossrail 2 and you think, well, actually, we've got to be bold with that too because... Uh, Danny Alexander, who was he? Where did he come from? He's back in the Western Isles, I suppose. But the rule that he put in when he was the Chief Secretary of the Treasury is that London should pay half the cost of Crossrail too. And the work that we've done with PwC and others, they suggest that London can finance it if you can find enough ways of doing it. And the wealth that it will generate in the city will be enough to sustain half of its con construction cost in various ways. The Mayor of the time is going to be, have to be a bit bold with some taxes that business won't, won't want to pay, but will probably realise it has to in some form. 
But actually, I think that fiscal devolution at that stage, at the moment at which Crossrail 2 becomes absolutely necessary for the city because, of the, uh, because it, it's so crowded, then actually the case for fiscal devolution will be made. And that will be a really good thing. It will be a good thing for the health of city government because then the mayor is going to have to stand up to how much money he needs to raise through taxes in the city and how much he can get through fares as well as what he or, or she can spend. Um, and it will also be a revolution in the way that we work in the, in the country in terms of cities because it will, it will demonstrate that a city can support substantial growth through its own means. And that, of course, is why Howard and I can share every platform together because I don't think his money is my money and he doesn't think my money is his money. We think that actually it's worth trying to find innumerable ways of funding all this to the extent to which we can locally through uh, pr property values going up and through other forms of taxation which are bearable so that actually we can recreate, uh, so that we can create economic wealth not only for, for our cities but for the, for the, for the country uh, as a whole. Um, I'm not sure I'm able to answer the uh, question posed, but then what I've learned, having been in close proximity to politicians for many years, is that you don't have to answer the questions <laughs> you're asked, or, or indeed at all, as I've learned from Boris sometimes, so um, I don't feel much obliged to do that. What, what I do feel is that, is, that, is, that it, is that it's very, very healthy to debate this, and what I've learned through being... I've just stepped down from being the president of the UITP, which is the International Public Transport Union, um, and what I've learned through doing that is that actually whilst we were on our own in our arguments about Crossrail in 2006 and not many people, at least in Europe, were very interested in how we were arguing or, or where the money was going, going to come from. I remember my friend Pierre Mongin in Paris, who's now moved on, he was completely uninterested. He said, I've got a 30-year plan for transport in this city and the government are going to fund it all. But they're interested now because no, no government's got the money to fund the economic growth, the, the faster economic growth of, of, of big cities. And they're interested now because this is a world issue about economic revival, which is, which is actually terribly important for the whole of the, for, for, for the, whole of the, you know, the, the world economic position. So it is a good thing to have a debate about, and I hope that you know, I admire the uh, vision for uh, David's HS2, and I also admire the fact that he, he, he and others look, <laughs> look as though they've got a team who, who, who can build it. In our own case, we're quite far down the road, road with some schemes. I must say I don't think that there will now be a transport scheme in this city in the foreseeable future which doesn't have a wider economic case about economic, uh, economic growth generation, about job creation and about building housing. If you were able to look that way through all these new, new, um, uh, new, new office buildings, you'd see Battersea Power Station, which is undoubtedly funded on just that basis. So, it, 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 so Simon, it, it is a great thing to debate. We haven't finished debating it. I think that, that certainly from a London perspective, uh, I've wished Howard both every success in Manchester and also all the help that he can have, not because we think that there's any threat to our economic growth in London, but because this country badly needs all that, all that, growth, uh, all, all that growth wherever it can come. And the last thing I've learned doing this job, and I hope I'll take it with me because I think it's a national issue as well as a London one, is that actually I started um, nine and a half years ago talking mostly about transport because that's what I thought I knew about. And what I've learned in the last at least four or five years is that that's not the right thing to talk about. The right thing to talk about is economic growth, jobs and housing, and then you observe quietly to an audience that's much more interested in that than they are about trains or buses or roads, that actually the way in which you facilitate it is, 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 is transport. Without it, you don't get it. With it, you get it. If it runs well, you get even more of it. Uh, and I think that that's at least what this city is. Proved. Now, whether that's a conclusion to anything that anybody else said here, it's certainly my conclusion. Thank you for listening and thank you. For